Neil from Chicago. Do you think AEW is building towards a blood and guts match between the elite and the team of Brian Danielson, Jungle Boy, Luchasaurus, Christian Cage, and a returning Hangman page? If so, should this be the main event of Full Gear? I believe this would also mark five straight years that Adam Cole has been in a War Games match if this does happen. I could envision that as a an eight-man tag or a ten-man tag, but not a blood and guts match. They already did one. Not that long ago. It was only in May, right? Cinco de Mayo. We had a blood and guts match. Now, I don't know if, if to them, it's going to be an annual thing. I mean, they could always, you know, bust out the blood and guts gimmick when there's a reason to. Kind of the way Hell in a Cell used to be many years ago. But I think it would be too much. I think it would be overkill to do two blood and guts matches this year. So no, I don't see that as being blood and guts, no, but a 10-man tag, yeah, I think that's very possible. Jad from London, Inc. and by the way, I would not do that as the main event of Full Gear. They only have four pay-per-views each year. Your main event should be an AEW championship match. You can save the, the tag team matches for television. I would not do that as the main event of Full Gear. Jad from London, England. I'd like to get your thoughts on Pat McAfee as a commentator. When he was managing Oni Lorcan, Danny Burch, and Pete Dunne on NXT, I thought he was one of the best characters on the show. But as a commentator on SmackDown, I find him to be fucking insufferable and one of the absolute worst characters on the show. I don't think he does or says anything to get anybody else over. He is a loudmouth, obnoxious prick. <laughs> wow. Uh, which doesn't serve commentating well, in my opinion. And don't get me started on the dancing on the announce table when Nakamura and Rick Boogs come out. I can't stand it. It hurts my ears and it grates my eyes. In this capacity, I think he adds nothing to the product. And if anything, he takes away from it. What do you think? Jad, I'm going to have to disagree with you on this hard, hard. I actually think he's done a tremendous job on commentary. And one of the reasons that Pat McAfee has been such a delight for me on SmackDown is that you can tell the effect that he has had on Michael Cole. Michael Cole has changed since Pat McAfee joined him on the commentary team. He is more animated when there is a big moment. You just look back at SummerSlam as one example when Brock Lesnar came out. In any other circumstance, Michael Cole would go, oh my, right? That's his signature call, oh my. But now, when John Cena came back, he lost his mind. He was marking out. When Brock Lesnar came out at SummerSlam, also marking out, losing his mind. I don't think that happens without Pat McAfee. I think Pat McAfee has driven Michael Cole to kind of change his shtick a little bit. He's probably made it more fun for him. When we get the occasional glance in the background of the announcers, you can see Cole laughing. Like, he's having a great time out there. So I actually think Pat McAfee has helped elevate Michael Cole's game. Uh, can McAfee be a little over the top? Yes. There are moments where he can be annoying, but I don't find him annoying and grating in the same way that, for example, I find Chris Jericho to be. When Chris Jericho gets animated on Rampage, I find him to be incredibly annoying. I, I don't feel the same way about Pat McAfee. I actually think he's done a very good job. In a very short period of time, I think he does a very good job. And he uh, clearly does not get on my nerves uh, the way that he does yours. But when they show him, like, you see him standing in the background. Like, when there's a really exciting moment, you'll see him. He stands, right? Even though Michael Cole is sitting, there's Pat McAfee. He's standing because he's a fan. And that enthusiasm, that that's not manufactured by Vince McMahon. I think that's maybe the other big thing about Pat McAfee. I don't get the sense, while I'm sure he might be getting direction in his ear, you know, on certain things to say by Vince McMahon, I don't get the sense that he's being phony. That's the one thing that I absolutely cannot stand about a lot of their announcers, whether it's Byron Saxton, Corey Graves, or whoever else it may have been over the years. There are times you can clearly tell, even Cole, there are times where you can clearly tell these people are being phony as shit. I don't like the blatant phoniness on the announcing. These people need to have credibility. I need to believe in what they're saying. They're the soundtrack of these shows. Jim Ross always had credibility. 
because you believed his emotion was genuine. Even if he was being over the top with it, stone cold, stone cold, you know, by God, that's just Jim Ross being Jim Ross. Triple H would do something dastardly. You bastard, you'll burn in hell. Like, <laughs> he was fucking great, right? Because it just felt genuine. So if we can get even a little bit of that, if, if that's what Pat McAfee does to help bring that out of Michael Cole, and if he brings that to the table himself, then you've already elevated the commentary game on, on your show. So I enjoy it. You are going to have to have a difference of opinion here because I think you're way off on this. But to each their own. I mean, look, if he hurts your ears, then he hurts your ears. But I don't have an issue with Pat McAfee. Stino from Salt Lake City, Utah. I've heard people refer to the Ultimate Warrior versus Goldberg as a dream match. I wanted to know your thoughts. My personal opinion is that it's about as much of a dream match as Giant Gonzalez against the Great Khali would be. I don't know who these people are that you speak of. If you are following these people on social media, you need to unfollow them immediately. That sounds like a nightmare, not a dream. I mean, as an 8-year-old or a 12-year-old... 25 years ago, it would have sounded cool on paper. Goldberg against the Warrior, but even in their physical primes. That sounds like a total disaster waiting to happen. That's like the blind leading the blind. Michael from Liverpool, England. My question is, when wrestling fans discuss potential dream matches we never got to see, one that I never see mentioned is Chris Benoit against Ken Shamrock. Both had an intense... <laughs> you could say that. Both had an intense shoot style with signature submission moves, which could lead to a great series of matches had the two of them feuded. Just wondered what your thoughts were. I had never thought about Benoit against Shamrock... Uh, they kind of just missed each other, right? Because 2000, I think, was the year Shamrock left. Benoit had just come in, so they did share some time on the same roster for a few months, and then Shamrock was gone not long after that. Yeah, I think they could have had a, a pretty good match. I don't look at it as a dream match. You know, I think that word gets bastardized and thrown around way too much. Oh, this is a dream match. It's a dream match. I, You know, there aren't that many realistic dream matches that I have in my mind. Uh, when I think back to dream matches that could have been and weren't, you know, you could come up with a whole bunch of them. I wouldn't say Shamrock and Benoit is one that would be on my list. I think it would have been a, a good match. I wouldn't call it a dream match. You know, for me, the ultimate dream match would have been, you know, in their prime. Kurt Angle against Bret Hart. I think that would have been just fucking fantastic. Uh, and I've even thought, of tag team-wise, Brett and Owen. Like, mid-90s Brett and Owen against 2002 Angle Benoit. When they were doing the tag team thing, and they actually were the tag team champions on SmackDown. You take Brett and Owen from that era, Angle and Benoit from that era, you put them together in a tag team match, you could headline any pay-per-view with that. But you mentioned Shamrock. I'll, I'll throw one at you. I, if anything, I look at this more as a, a dream match than I do Shamrock and Benoit. Is Shamrock and Angle. I mean, that would have been an obvious match to do, right? The Battle of the Ankle Locks. Kurt Angle and Ken Shamrock, I think, would have been a hell of a match. But I still think that word uh, dream gets thrown around more than it should. And Frank... From Canyon, Texas. Did you ever attend any ECW shows at the ECW arena during the 90s? I did not. I think I would have been terrified. <laughs> if I were older, then I absolutely would have gone. But for younger me who, you know, didn't really know any better, and I wasn't following the ECW product weekly. I wasn't watching the weekly show. I was aware of them. I knew who the big names were. And I had seen, you know, some matches and stuff, but, uh, but having not been there, I, I, you know, I didn't know any better. So no, I didn't get the chance to go. I'm still kicking myself for not going to that first one night stand. That'll, that's one of my biggest regrets right in my backyard. And I've been to that building since then so many times. I started going to that building like a year or two after that for, for ring of honor shows. And I had a blast. I would have loved to have been in the building for that first one night stand pay-per-view. 
But no, I never went to any of the original ECW shows back in the 90s. 